I've been given a choice of amphibious vehicles to take a look at this time around. And although this seep looks to be in absolutely lovely condition, well, I see something bigger. 1947, a requirement is drawn up to replace the armoured cars of the British Army. Alvis has a crack at it, and they develop, as part of the 600 series, the 601, the Saladin. This armoured car had six evenly spaced wheels, it was all-wheel drive, and it entered service. It was actually rather a good export success. A couple of derivatives later, you go to the 603, which is the Saracen armoured personnel carrier, and then you come to the Salamander, which is more of a truck. It's actually a fire tender. This then was the stepping point for the truck high mobility load carrier FV620, known as the Stalwart. And why it's exactly called a truck and not a lorry, I'm not entirely sure. I have noticed that all the way through World War II there were actually trucks in the British Army. But what the English definition is between a truck and a lorry, somebody will have to fill me in because I don't know what it is. Either way, the FV620 was soon supplemented in service by the stalwart Mark II, the FV622. And it can be easily identified by the fact that the windows are much bigger so that the driver can see out. It does, though, share the same basic 6x6 design and a very large number of the automotive components with the other vehicles of the 600 series. So, guess what? We are going to have a quick gander around this 622, which is available for sale at the Rock Island Auction Company's auction in early May. So as you are touring around the Stolly, don't forget that this is also a boat, not just a 6x6 vehicle, hence the relatively hydrodynamic shape at the front. You do have your indicators, there's a towing pintle mount, and that's it. It's smoothed down, the headlights are recessed behind brush guards, not just for brush, but also because if you're floating around, you can't see what's beneath the water surface, most likely. So, you know, safety first, as it were. And there's nothing until you get to the wheels. They're 20-inch wheels and have a central tire inflation system. The cab, it looks armored. It's not. It's really just sheet metal. The bolts are there to hold the windows in place, of course. And beyond the wind mirror, you will see that there is no door, because doors are holes. And holes are where water can get in, and you don't want your stolly to sink. And there's enough other ways this thing can sink, though a door is one less problem. So in order to get in, you get in through the top. So your first step is going to be the hub, then you climb up, you grab handles past the fuel tank filler, and up the top you get, which is a little bit inconvenient, but I guess it's more convenient than trying to drag out a sunk stalwart. Then you get to the wheels. Lots of shock absorbers everywhere. And, well, the wheels are the unique feature of this series of vehicles, really. They are equidistant and they are equipowered. So I, I'm trying to figure out the best way of describing this. There is a differential between the left side of the vehicle and the right side of the vehicle. So if you're going around corners, uh, the shorter radius described by the inside wheels is accounted for. It's a no-slip diff, though, so when you're off-road and you're losing traction, all six wheels are grinding away together. Okay, fantastic. This thing is a great vehicle off-road. On the road, though, this can be something of a problem. And indeed, the manual makes several references to the issue of wind-up which ha is worse the faster you go and the longer you go. It overheats the transmission and eventually breaks it. The tire pressures in the manual to the front are 28 and to the rear are 40, and the middle is something I can't recall offhand, which inherently gives you this problem of a circumference difference that is going to put inherent wind-up in your system as you're driving along. Worse is the steering because the two front axles are steered, the back one isn't. And incidentally, there is a swing arm uh, which connects the two front axles for steering. The pivot point for the swing arm is a little bit further towards the center axle than it is the front axle. So this means that as it swings, there's greater movement applied to the front axle than there is to the rear axle. Well, this then means that as you go around the corner, the three wheels on one side are all rotating at different speeds more wind-up problems. 
Off-road, this isn't a problem because if you're on grass or mud or whatever, there's enough lack of traction between the tires and the surface or that one tire and the surface that the vehicle will unwind itself. On roads though, you have a problem and the solution is basically you either find some off-road section that you can unwind yourself or you find some way of finding suitably bumpy terrain that it'll raise a wheel off the ground briefly, it'll unwind itself and it'll drop down. So if you can find the bumpy terrain, maybe curb the vehicle a lot or railroad ties, there's ways of doing it. So that is the cost of having the fantastic off-road mobility. Being an amphibious vehicle, of course, it has to be propelled through the water. And although a lot of vehicles use their wheels or tracks, this has an honest to God screw system inside this tunnel. A little bit of grating to stop uh, large foreign objects from jamming the system. And towards the back, you can see that there's a reverser system. A shutter comes back, closes off the regular exit and forces the water forwards to propel you backwards. The manual states that when you're entering the water, you ideally wish to do it at a shallow slope, get floating first, and then engage the propeller drive. If you're going into a steep slope, engage the propeller drive first. It doesn't say why. It does note, though, that if warning signs start going off about flooding, to immediately turn on the bilge pump, which I would have thought would be a no-brainer, but hey, whatever. Coming around to the back, well, you got your tail lights, tow pintle, and, of course, the drop gate. The sides will drop as well. Now again, remember, this thing carries five tons of cargo on top of its already nine ton weight. And you're floating. So there is going to be a, uh, a somewhat high water line and you want to make sure that, well, no water gets into your bed. Oh, it, it also does say, um, be sure that the cargo is centered and secured before you float. I wonder why. But anyway, to open it up, there are two of these large levers. It is possible to do it with one man. That will get you to your first stage. If you want to go any further down, yeah, you unhook the lever. And down you go. And you can see the rubber sealant that is used to ensure that not too much water gets in to destroy your cargo. I'll hop in the back in a little bit. On the right side, we see a filler port for what I have to assume is coolant, uh, not least because the radiator is located right here. And of course, the exhaust pipe is located high and clear of the water. All right, so let's see what's in the cab. So as you're getting in, the first thing you'll notice is that the seat underneath the entrance hatch, of course there's two entrance hatches, has a fold forward feature and on the back side of the backrest is an embossed metal plate. So you're not going to slip with your wet muddy boots and kill yourself. The second thing you'll notice is that the driver's position is in the middle. Now remember, Britain is right hand drive territory. The Germans are left hand drive and guess where these things were supposed to operate mainly. Now there's two ways of dealing with the problem. One is that you simply purchase left-hand drive equipment for use on the continent and right-hand drive equipment for use at home. And indeed, a large number of uh, vehicles that the British or the Irish and so on have procured have done this. The alternative is you just split the difference, you put the driver in the middle, which considering this vehicle is mainly supposed to be off-road, actually makes a lot of sense. Now, the position is unfortunately not comfortable. Um, as you can see, my head is bashing off the roof. There would be, I think, a pad on this mounting here. Uh, but I have driven one of these before. And, spoiler alert, 
this is quite possibly the most fun vehicle I have ever driven. I've driven tanks, I've driven cars, I've driven sports cars, open wheelers. This off-road is just magnificent to drive. And if I recall correctly, and this has been many years, the power assisted steering is such that it's not just power assisted, it's power driven. You'd start the wheel spinning like a roulette wheel and you'd catch it where you wanted it to stop. So I remember driving off road, just flinging this wheel left and right and was having a whale of a time. Manual transmission, of course. A lot of the fluids are filled in the front. So for example, the brakes, uh, brake fluid is filled here front right. Directly behind me on top of the 110 gallon fuel tank is where you would uh, fill the steering fluid. Batteries are out of position, they would ordinarily be on the right rear. On the left hand side are two levers which are known in the manual as navigation steering levers. Which I have to presume is how you steer when you're in the water. And unfortunately I'm on my own so I can't check but I, I strongly suspect that as I pull this it opens and closes the reverser buckets down by the, uh, uh, the uh, screws. When they made the 622s, as mentioned, they made the windows much bigger. And frankly, you can see why they've done this. It just gives you much, much better vision as to what it is that you're going to drive over. So uh, this is, again, very capable vehicle for driving off road. I can't say that enough, I guess. Dials, knobs and switches. Other than that, well, handbrake on the left, your typical three position for the brake, accelerator and clutch. Um, the gear shift, gear shift is on the right, the takeoff drive lever is back behind me to my right here for the uh, propeller drive. Windshield wiper front and center controlled by the motor up here. And yeah, that's uh, pretty much everything I can say. There is, according to the manual, there is supposed to be a wheel position indicator in here somewhere down the lower right but i'm not seeing it um, the bilge pump switch though is in position some vehicles will come with a winch and if you have a winch there is a second lever back behind the screw power takeoff and that will be for the winch little indicator system here for your hazards and indicators other than that, well, maximum speed officially is about 40 miles an hour on the road, although I'm not sure you'd want to do that much. Your 110 gallons of fuel behind you there will get you at four and a half miles to the gallon. I guess a better part of 600 miles, which actually isn't bad at all. Other than that, well, it's a truck. If you fit in the vehicle, which I don't, I would not be a stalwart driver for any length of time whatsoever, unless I drove like this. And uh, there are, of course, armored hatch, or not armored, but metal hatches, which will come down on top, keep the rain out. I don't know why they did that. I mean, they might as well have just put canvas, but maybe they're expecting the, the bow might actually get completely submerged if something goes hideously wrong. Not much else to say. I mean, if you like driving six by sixes off road, this is the truck for you. A maintenance feature I appreciate. You will recall that the duck also, in order to access the automotive components, you had to go through the cargo bed. And that's because you have a hull underneath, which again, you want to have as few holes in as possible. Well, instead of individual panels that are kind of lifted up separately, what the British have done here is they've simply hinged central panels and they just go out of the way. In fact, they're hinged a little bit inwards so that you don't even need to remove everything from the bed. You just have to keep it off to the side. Oops, this one first. So now we have it open and it's impressive to think that the five tons of cargo is held just by these cross beams and corrugated metal. But hey, there you go. And now we've got a wonderful view of everything inside here. So starting off with the fuel tank at the front, coming back, 
The differential will be under here with the takeoffs to each side and you can see the power shafts front and rear way down at the bottom there. Then you come back through the five speed transmission to the power takeoff for the propulsion system for the water, the screws comes up and then into the tunnels. Further back behind that we have our air cleaners, the intakes are little slots in the side here. The movement of air seems to be from a gap between the cargo bed and the cab up front. It doesn't look like a big gap but I guess it doesn't need a lot. Comes all the way back and then uh, what doesn't get taken in by the engine of course goes to the radiator fans at the back through the radiator grill at the very back and then out the rear. The engine is a Rolls-Royce B81. It's a straight eight cylinder 6.5 liter about 240 horsepower and well as I said that's what pushes you along. The suspension by the way you don't you haven't seen any springs really it's torsion bars with lots of shock absorbers and that's basically all there is to say for the inside of the Stolly. this is what makes it work. So there you go the FV622 Stalwart Mark II. A word of warning these things are a hell of a lot of fun and highly capable, but they are also extremely maintenance intensive. So if you're thinking about buying this one, do the research first and make sure you've got the capacity to handle it. The wheels are big. You know, I need to look this one up. But there is no leeway given to whether or not the front wheels and the back wheels are turning at the same speed. And they won't be because, you know, even if you have all-wheel drive, uh, is it all-wheel drive steering? All-wheel drive steering. I do not see a way of that steering. I do not see a way of that steering. about doing this without a big piece of paper sticking in my arse.